Good evening, everyone. My name is Sanjeev. Um, I'm working here in Land Marvel Company as an admin executive. Uh, I got a few questions, but I'll ask only two questions uh, regarding this uh, Islam. First question is, uh, uh, do Islam believe in rebirth? Uh, and second question is, in Islam, it's not allowed to commit suicide. But many people that in Pakistan, in Arabic countries, they are uh, blowing themselves up and they are killing many people. So who, they, who are the people they are motivating them? Whether they are fall, really following the Islam or who is motivating them? That is my question, sir. There are two questions. The first question, does Islam believe in rebirth? And the second question, that is suicide prohibited in Islam? How come people in Pakistan, other part of the world, they are blowing up themselves and killing themselves, the two questions. As far as the first question is concerned, that does Islam believe in rebirth? If you ask only in rebirth, yes, Islam believes in rebirth. What we believe? That a human beings come to this world once, the Quran says, that we give you life and come on this earth. Then we cause you to die, and then we resurrect you again in the next life. This is exactly what is mentioned in the Vedas. If you read Rig Ved, book number 10, it speaks about Punar Janam. Punar means next, Janam means life. So the Ved speaks about Punar Janam, about the next life. But unfortunately, most of the Hindus, they misunderstand the meaning of Punar Janam. Punar means next, Janam means life. We believe in the next life. You say Punar Janam, you say rebirth, we have no problem. But most of the Hindus, they believe in a philosophy known as samsara. It's a Sanskrit word, samsara, which means birth, death, birth, death. A cycle of reincarnation, a cycle of birth, death, birth, death, birth, death. This cycle of birth, death, birth, death, or samsara, or reincarnation, is nowhere to be found in the Vedas. What they quote is a verse of Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 2, verse number 22, which says that like a human being takes off the old clothes and puts on new clothes, same way the soul throws away the old body and puts on the new body. As far as this is concerned, I've got no objection with the Bhagavad Gita. It's further mentioned even in the Upanishads that like a caterpillar walks up a grass of blade, it jumps onto the new grass, I've got no problem. Now, as far as the scriptures are concerned, if you take the literal meaning of the Ved, which does not speak about the cycle of birth, death, birth, death, but only speaks about Punar Janam, next life, Islam speaks the same. But most of the scholars of Hinduism, they could not understand that how can a human being be born with some congenital defect? How can he be born as a handicap? Some are born healthy, some are born handicapped, some are born in rich family, some are born in poor family. So they thought this was injustice. So how could God be unjust? Therefore they propounded the theory of samsara, which is nowhere to be found in the Vedas. The Vedas are considered as the highest Hindu scriptures. In the Hindu scriptures, we have the Smriti and you have the Shruti. Smriti means scripture written by the human beings. And Shruti are the Vedas and Upanishads considered to be the word of God. Now, because they could not justify why some people are born in rich family, some in poor family, some are born healthy, some with congenital defect, they propounded this theory of samsara. As far as Islam is concerned, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 2, Allah zi khalakal wal hayata. It's Allah who has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. This life you are leading is a test for the hereafter. And we believe that every child is born sinless, is born masoom. Irrespective of whether he's born handicapped or healthy, whether rich family, poor family, all these things are a test for the human beings. As Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, and Surah Anfal, chapter number eight, verse number 28, it says that surely we will test you with fear and hunger, with loss of life, and loss of what you have earned. It's mentioned in Surah Anfal, chapter number 8, verse number 28, that 
your children and your wife are a test for you. Now here we realize that the Quran says your children are a test for you. Now if a child, suppose, is born handicapped, it's a test for the parents. The parents may be very good, they may be pious, maybe Allah wants to test them more. After giving them a child which is handicapped, yet do they have faith in Allah or not? It's a test. So whenever any calamity befalls a human being, it's either a punishment or a test. Whenever any good thing happens in your life, it's either a reward or it's a test. That does not mean if something bad happens, it has to be a punishment. It can be a punishment, it can be a test. If something good happens in your life, it can be a reward or it can be a test. So here, Almighty God is testing the parents that do they have faith in Almighty God? So if a handicapped child is born, the parent may be an average Muslim, and if he says, oh, why? My child only has to be born handicapped. Why my child has to be born with a congenital heart disease? Allah is testing them. The people who are good Muslims, they'll say, Allah has destined, no problem yet. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And more difficult the test, more higher is the reward. To pass a simple graduation of BA is easy. But to pass MBBS is difficult. The moment you pass MBBS in front of any you get doctor, DR full stop. Higher status. Examination is difficult, the honor is more. So Almighty God tests different people different way. The child that is born, what the Hindus said, the Hindu scholars, in his previous janam, in his previous birth, he did a sin, therefore he was born handicapped. They didn't have any other justification. If you do good deeds, then you are born healthy. So what the Hindu scholars, they propounded, that every living creature, it keeps on changing. According to them, the universal brother in Hinduism is, all living creatures are your brothers. So sometimes you are born as an animal, sometimes as a bird, sometimes as a rat, sometimes as a cockroach, sometimes as a human being. And the human being is the highest level. And you are born as a human being seven times. So they came with this philosophy because they could not justify why a child is born rich or poor, handicapped or healthy. Similarly, for a person who's born poor, it's a test for him. For the rich people, he has to give zakat. Every rich person who has a saving of more than a nisab level, 85 grams of gold, he or she should give 2.5% of that saving every lunar year in charity. For the poor person, for him, he gets full marks in zakat. He's poor. So he has to give no zakat, 100 out of 100. But we say, Are garib admi, poor man. Poor man. Poor man, he's got 100 out of 100 in zakat. The rich man, if he gives proper zakat, he may get 100 out of 100. He says, okay, fine, I've got so much wealth. This part is exempted from zakat. He may give 50% of zakat. So he'll get negative points. He may not give zakat at all. So imagine, suppose there's a questioner. There's a question in a question paper, which is very easy. Should you be happy or sad? So when a person is born poor, actually in zakat, he gets 100 out of 100. Therefore, beloved prophet said, it's easier for a poor man to go to Jannah than a rich man. But we say, a garib admi, a poor man. How sad. Not sad. 100 out of 100 in zakat. For the rich man, he has to give charity, he has to give zakat, he has to give donation, he'll be accountable for his wealth. So what in Islam, we are born in this world once, and once is sufficient. Once we die, we are resurrected on the day of judgment. You want to call it rebirth, I've got no problem. You want to call it punarjanam, I've got no problem. We say life after death. But surely, if I agree with you for sake of argument, for sake of argument, what the Hindu scholars propound, that you know, sometime you're born as animal, sometime bird, sometime human being. I want to ask you the question whether in this world, as every year is passing on, is the population of the human beings increasing or decreasing, brother? Increasing or decreasing? Increasing. Increasing. Very good. Is the sin in the world increasing or decreasing? I can't hear you. Increasing or decreasing? Increasing, sir. Sorry? No. Increasing. Increasing. Human beings are increasing, and even sin is increasing. If I agree with the philosophy of Hindu scholars, more the sin increases, the population of human beings should decrease. 
So therefore, I believe in going to the higher scriptures, Vedas. When I talk, we had given the talk earlier in Chennai, during the first peace conference, that was in 2004, similarities between Islam and Hinduism. And there, I showed and compared that even in Ved, it speaks about one God, no idol worship, and everything. So what is common between the scriptures we follow? So this, the cycle of samsara, birth, death, birth, death, is nowhere to be found in the Vedas. It's the philosophy of the Hindu scholars to justify because they could not justify why human beings are born poor or healthy, which I've given you the answer in Islam. As far as the second question is concerned, that is suicide haram in Islam, is it prohibited? If yes, then why do people commit suicide? Is somebody instigating them? Suicide bombing? The Quran says in Surah Bakra, chapter number two, verse number 195, that do not make your own hand the cause of your destruction. So according to the Quran, Committing suicide is haram, it is prohibited. So as far as committing suicide, it is prohibited. As far as killing any other innocent human being, the Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 32, that if anyone kills any other human being, whether it be a Muslim or non-Muslim, unless it be for murder or for spreading corruption in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. And if anyone saves any human being, it is as though you have saved the whole of humanity. So killing any innocent human being, whether they be a Muslim or non-Muslim, it is prohibited in Islam. So if anyone, whether he puts a bomb without killing himself or with killing himself, if he kills an innocent human being, it is prohibited. So as far as killing innocent human being is concerned, it is prohibited. If you use it as a strategy of war, you know, the Japanese used to do the suicide, you know. Initially, where do you get suicide bombing from? According to a professor who wrote a book, Dying to Win in America, he says that the first people who did suicide bombing were the LTT, Tamil Tigers. But yet the blame is put on Muslims, I don't know why. It's the media. Have you ever heard of any Muslim doing suicide bombing, it was first the LTT and then the Americans and maybe some of the Muslims, black sheep may have picked up, but who were the originators? But yet when suicide bombing comes, the terrorists are labeled as Muslims. In Chennai a few years back, I also given a talk on terrorism and jihad, an Islamic perspective. Well, I've described in detail about this answer of suicide bombing as far as Islamic perspective is concerned, but killing innocent human being and committing suicide is haram. Hope that answers the question, brother.